I want to introduce you to Gaston um, Donald this evening, Prime Minister Howard. And we're going to ask the director of the CBS, the brilliant director of the CBS, that's the correct, mm -hmm. pretty mix, um, to come and say a word about what's happening in CBS, then I will, I will say a few words in the introduction. Tim Thomas. Thank you very much indeed. This is a very exciting time to be the director of London's leading independent think tank. Talking to many of the senior special advisors across Whitehall in recent weeks, I've been struck by how sharp their appetite is for the work which we are doing now. From tax simplification to cutting welfare dependency, from innovation and entrepreneurialism to reform of BBC, from liberating planning to revitalizing savings. Our voice is being heard. Don't just take my word for this. For just yesterday, a leading financial journal commented, you'd have, to, you'd have to be blind to miss the fact that the government's new consultation paper bared more than a little similarity to the latest briefing note from the Center for Policy Studies. Indeed, George Osborne could actually have been reading from Michael Johnson's missive. That's not all there, they continued. Michael Johnson has long been calling for more consolidation of the local government pension scheme in order to bring costs down. Surprise, surprise, the full budget document revealed that Osborne agrees, word for word. The article concluded, either the Center for Policy Studies has developed serious clairvoyant skills, or they've got the ear of the chancellor. Either way, for spoilers ahead of the autumn statement later this year, you could do no worse than to look at anything coming out from the Centre for Policy Studies. Yeah. So, to those of you here this evening who support our work, thank you. And be confident that we will continue to make the case for policies based on our founding principles of low tax, a small state, freedom within the rule of law, and a strong nation. To anyone who is not already a supporter, then now is your chance to correct the error of your ways by, at the very least, becoming a member of the CPS, which forms are on your chairs. Finally, I'd like to say a personal word of thanks to John Howard, not least because he was the first person to confirm that he would speak at our rather successful conference last year, the Margaret Thatcher Conference on Liberty. As so often, where he led, many others followed. Thank you, John, and thank you all here this evening. This is, you know, is um, the, the, the latest in a long series of Keith Joseph lectures. You are a very distinguished audience, respecting and honoring the most distinguished man who was Margaret Thatcher, was the great founder of the great institution that lives on under Tim Knox's directorship. Before I, before I go any further at all, would you please um, say a, a proper CPS welcome to the Joseph family, to his daughter Hannah, and to his grandsons Anthony and Alex who are with us tonight. Mrs. Thatcher only won three elections 
row, and John Howard won four election victories in a row. And in, in the sense of the number four, I'd like you, I'd like you to know that he personally taught me personally four lessons about how to win a how to win a general election, which he is, as I say, the master. I'll tell you what the four lessons are very briefly. First, he said that politics is, election campaigns are an intellectual battle. In other words, that the winner is the one who has the best arguments, not the prettiest face. This was, for me, a life-changing insight. He said that um, election campaigns are, and politics generally, actually, he said, are, uh, politics is an adversarial activity. But what he meant was that you will either hit or be hit. But the thing to do would be to hit first, hit hard, and keep on hitting. <laughs> and that therefore, this is not, general elections are not a world for the squeamish or the faint hearted. You would immediately see in these four lessons the, the, the words and thoughts of Keith Joseph himself, because they're very similar. Third, he taught me that an interest to display an interest in economics is not proof that you have a heart of stone. On the, on the contrary, as John Howard would put it, as Mrs. Thatcher and Keith Joseph put it, caring that works costs cash. And that, in Keith Joseph's view, the story of the Good Samaritan shows that first you need the money in order to do the, the good works. He taught me that there is a direct connection between money and freedom, and that to deny the connection between money and freedom is hypocrisy. For the Conservative Party, it's worse than hypocrisy. It's an attempt at the denial. It's an attempt to roam the conservative faith with one all, which doesn't work if you go around in circles. And it's the discovery of that fact by David Cameron, recently as leader of the Conservative Party, that ended 20 years of conservative opposition and led to the great election victory which the Conservative Party has just had. And fourth and finally, and probably this is, these are all intellectual points, this is the most um, John Howard came to speak to us in the shadow cabinet before an election campaign which we lost. And he said, at the end of speaking to the shadow cabinet, he, he asked us a really extraordinary question, which was, there was, a, there was a general election coming up, and he said, I don't know if you, if you remember this, John Mike Howard was certainly remember. He, he said, how much do you actually want to win this election? And um, he explained why he asked what seemed to be a, a really amazing question by saying that if you don't really want to win the election that is coming up because you believe so strongly in that your ideas and your beliefs and your values are correct, therefore you must win this election in order to prevent the other person with their, with their noble idea. If you don't have that kind of idealism, self-belief and absolute conviction that you must win, you won't win. Anyway, we didn't win. But the lesson, the lesson is an incredibly important one. But I, I would like to say to John now that in the, in the name of the values which Tim Knox <coughs> just illuminated, <coughs> a small state, low tax, freedom, independence, self-determination, individuality, that in the name of those values, I'd like you to give the warmest possible welcome to the Prime Minister, John Howard. Well, Lord Saatchi, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I particularly acknowledge the presence of uh, the late Keith Joseph's daughter and two grandsons. It's quite a pleasure to be asked to deliver this lecture to the Centre of Policy Studies. I chose as a title for this um, lecture the Endless Foot Race. Now you may wonder why I chose that title uh, for a lecture. 
When I was Prime Minister, I used to frequently say to my colleagues and to the broader Australian public that the cause of economic reform was rather like being in an endless foot race. You had to keep going, you never got to the finishing line, you daren't give up because if you did, your competitors would surge past you. Now, there's nothing particularly uh, original or novel about that, and I'm sure it's a metaphor that other people have used. But I've always, um, since being uh, removed from uh, public life in Australia by the electorate in the normal democratic process, and it was very nice of Lord Saatchi to talk about the uh, four wins in a row, but there was a fifth loss, but in Ashen's parlance, Ashen's parlance Four out of five tests is not bad. <laughs> now, my country has not got off to the strongest start uh, when it comes to that subject, but we still have a possibility uh, to uh, get four out of five, but that's wistful thinking. All I can say as uh, a well-known Australian cricket tragic, a keenly fought Ashes series between England and Australia is the epitome uh, of uh, fine cricket and the, the ultimate that anybody who loves that wonderful game would possibly want. But having chosen uh, the title of the endless foot race, I discovered on deeper analysis of Keith Joseph's career, the extraordinary influence he had on Margaret Thatcher and the formation of the Centre of Policy Studies, uh, how apt it really was because he epitomised somebody who believed that the process of economic reform was in fact an endless <coughs> foot race. You kept going. You never said, well, that's all we need to do. We've reformed the economy. We've fixed the taxation system. We've privatised uh, all of those inefficient government enterprises. We've freed the labour market. We've done all of those things, and we really don't want to do any more. The truth, of course, is that the work uh, uh, has never been done, has never been finished, uh, and uh, it is absolutely essential that that foot race continue. I, I could do no better when analysing the relationship between Margaret Thatcher and Keith Joseph, which was so important not only to the fortunes of the Conservative Party at that particular time and the formation of the Centre of Policy Studies, but also the impact her thinking and the thinking of others around at the time had on the ideological debate here in Britain and throughout the Western world and not least in my own country, Australia. I could do no better than to quote from that magnificent first volume of the Thatcher biography written by Charles Moore. And if you'll forgive me, I'd like to quote from it verbatim because I think it provides the right description of that relationship and gives some kind of uh, context to what I want to say to you tonight. Moore wrote, the Centre of Policy Studies gave Mrs Thatcher the context, the sense of direction and the camaraderie that she sought. For her, the CPS was the chance to get back to the North Star almost literally to find the words for what she knew she believed, but which the Heath years had suppressed. From the beginning to the end of her career, Mrs Thatcher maintained an unbounded admiration and affection for Keith Joseph. His gentlemanly public spiritedness, his sometimes tortured courtesy, his Jewishness, his enthusiasm for policy, his interest in the intersection but economic, social and welfare subjects, which many Tory grandees considered beneath their notice. All these endeared him to her. In Heath's cabinet, the two were drawn closer by a growing unease which neither fully articulated at the time. After the defeat of February 1974, their feelings burst out like a forbidden love at last permitted to express itself. Now that is uh, an emphatic and interesting and touching way of describing a very close friendship and a very strong intellectual partnership. 
And you have to, of course, remember context. This was the mid-1970s. It's easy now for us of a centre-right disposition. For the first time, I observed the Lord Saatchi for more than 50 years. You have in the four old Commonwealth countries, and I still use that expression, because I think there is a difference between the old Commonwealth countries and, and, and the broader Commonwealth. Of the four old Commonwealth countries, this is the first time in more than 50 years that we have unfettered centre-right governments. And I say unfettered deliberately because as a result of the last election in Britain, the Conservative Party now governs in its own right. For the first time in Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And that's valuable in that we can copy from each other. And it's also valuable in uh, reminding uh, those of the centre-right disposition uh, how difficult the struggle has often been in like-minded countries uh, to achieve uh, unfettered office. But it's worth going back to the mid-1970s. It was a time of extraordinary hesitation uh, in countries such as Britain and Australia and the United States and indeed New Zealand and Canada and many others. The mid-1970s were a time of extraordinary disillusionment in the United States. The president had resigned uh, under a cloud for the first time ever in the history of that great country. America was still living with the failure of the Vietnam War in which Australia fought, of course, alongside the United States. Uh, Britain uh, had experienced extraordinary political turmoil and was suffering continuing economic decline. And Australia was going through a period of painful readjustment after a period of more than 20 years of une an uninterrupted economic growth that had come to a halt. And under a Labor <coughs> government, uh, many of the things that people took for granted and the stability they assumed would always be there uh, was uh, under threat. And of course it was a period of time that predated by a number of years the declaration by Deng Xiaoping in 1978 that China would embrace a market approach to economic management, an event that has had extraordinary influence uh, on uh, the development not only of China but of course the economic development of the world. It was 15 years before the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, there was within our democracies of the West there was a large amount of cultural dithering still going on. It's easy now to say that uh, there was always a resolute belief that the values of the West would triumph over the values of the Soviet-led East. That wasn't the case in the 1970s. There was still a great deal of moral equivalence talk in the West. That um, magnificent uh, uh, policy advisor that many of you will know, and I'm delighted to say is now residing in Sydney, uh, John O'Sullivan, uh, wrote a book uh, called um, the Pope, the President and the Prime Minister. And uh, in it he had this remarkable phrase that in a sense said it all. And, he, and I quote, put simply, Bob told her, the, I, my Polish is poor, uh, uh, the, the surname of Pope John Paul II, put simply, Bob told her was too Catholic, Margaret Thatcher was too conservative, and Reagan was too American. And what he was saying, of course, was that their views would never be accepted within the church in the case of the man who became Pope John Paul II, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. And when Ronald Reagan, as late as 1985, 86 rather, uh, said, Mr Gorbachev, tear down this wall, there were plenty of people who shuffled their feet and looked at the ground and said, really, this is not quite the way to bring about uh, the tom and understanding between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union. I mention these things to make the point that what we now see as the accepted wisdom of the views of Margaret Thatcher and of Keith Joseph and of Ronald Reagan and so many others, they were not 
uh, so assumed to be accepted and to be appropriate uh, back in the 1970s. And it only underlines the extraordinary courage and far-sightedness of Keith Joseph and Margaret Thatcher. And it also serves to underline the extraordinary success of the philosophy that they espoused, because it was a philosophy that brought about a shift, if I can use the jargon of political combat, a quantum shift to the right in the economic debate around the world. And it was not just a shift to the right within centre-right parties. In the interest of intellectual honesty, one has to acknowledge the impact of their views, even though neither of the governments I'm about to mention would ever acknowledge it, but the impact of their views on Labor governments in both Australia and New Zealand. Because the Hawke government in Australia, with our support from opposition, carried out a number of sensible market economic reforms. And it, it's my view that no finance minister in the 1980s could possibly uh, retouch Roger Douglas of New Zealand uh, for the market-based economic reforms that he carried out as the finance minister in the Longy government. Of course, the revolution that the CPS helped start, what's frequently called the Thatcher-Reagan revolution, was never, of course, only about economics. I think Keith Joseph once made a speech saying there's more to this than monetarism. Although the theories of monetarism enunciated by Milton Friedman and many others form the core of the intellectual thrust of the Centre of Policy Studies and of Keith Joseph in the 1970s, uh, it was of course much more than that. There was a great deal of in what the Centre of Policy Studies stood for of what Keith Joseph stood for and what Margaret Thatcher stood for, uh, of reasserting cultural self-belief. Part of the malaise of the 1970s in many of our societies was a, lack, a growing lack of cultural self-belief. And if I can contextualise that to today, uh, we, we read almost daily of the challenge of Islamic State of Islamic extremism, uh, which uh, of course has uh, in recent weeks uh, tragically taken the lives of some 38 citizens of the United Kingdom. Uh, we should remind ourselves that of the many responses to the challenge of this kind of, of barbaric extremism uh, is not to somehow or other imagine that fault lies with our societies, but rather to reassert uh, our own cultural self-belief and to understand that the last thing we should ever do is to compromise the fundamental values and attitudes of the societies of which we are privileged to be a member. Of course, the centre of gravity of economic debate has shifted and the contribution that has been made by Margaret Thatcher and the Centre of Policy Studies and of Keith Joseph of that has been immense. But that is not to imagine, of course, that the centre of gravity of economic debate has, having shifted in that direction, that is not to imagine for a moment that the task of further economic reform uh, is no longer in front of us. One of the greatest challenges to the economic reformer, of course, is to the maintenance, is to maintain the gains that have been made to date. One of the welcome things of the changes brought about by Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom was that most of those changes, particularly in the area of the labour market and of privatisation, of private ownership uh, of what was once council housing, most of those changes have been kept in place. <clears throat> but there's always a challenge when great um, strides have been made, there's always a challenge that the changes will be unwound by a subsequent government. That regrettably has happened in Australia in one very important area. Australia over a period of some 30 years went through major economic changes. We reformed our taxation system. We sold government-owned enterprises. 
We liberated the exchange rate, we admitted foreign banks, and we removed tariff protection for previously highly protected industries. Most of those reforms have remained. However, in the area of the labour market, the previous Labor government in Australia has unwound most of those reforms and the country has returned uh, to an industrial relations system that owes more uh, to the dominance of the trade union movement uh, of the 1960s and the 1970s. So one of the great challenges of people of our disposition is to make sure that uh, hard fought gains on the reform front are not forfeited in the future. It's also very important to understand that the environment in which free market policies are applied can change over time. Although there are constant, through all of constants rather, through all of the examination I make of uh, free market policies and their application, it is also important to remember that circumstances can change to render previous beliefs about the impact of policy no longer relevant. I raise the consideration, for example, whether we might be living in a slightly new paradigm concerning monetary policy. We have seen over the past several years, we have seen a remarkable amount of what's called euphemistically quantitative easing. Um, when it first started, I ran into no end of people probably sharing the broad philosophical views of this audience who were willing to argue that quantitative easing would lead to an outburst of inflation. Now that hasn't happened. Some will argue that it will eventually happen. I'm not sure. And what I simply pose to you is the question, uh, is it to be the case that the quantitative easing which has threatened uh, to unleash uh, large bouts of inflation will in fact not have that impact and that perhaps we have uh, entered into a period in the economic experience of open market economies that what previously was thought to be the con consequence of unlimited amounts of liquidity sloshing around in the system uh, is no longer the consequence and that it is no longer the case that if you inject never-ending amounts of liquidity into the system, you will have an inflation reaction. And perhaps we have entered an era where uh, that particular aspect of the operation of monetary policy is not what we thought it might be, and that therefore we could well indeed uh, have a situation where uh, a focus on other aspects of the operation of the economy, particularly on the supply side, uh, will need to be given greater attention. And that is why I think that many of the reforms that have been carried out in the areas of education uh, by the Cameron government since it was elected in 2010 have been so welcome. Because as Bill English, the Finance Minister of New Zealand, reminded an Australian audience only three weeks ago, when delivering a, a lecture to the Menzies Research Centre in Melbourne. Uh, he reminded us that it's the obligation of centre-right governments not only to contain the level of government spending, but also to improve the quality of the delivery <coughs> of those government services that the state still deems it necessary to deliver. And it's not surprising, of course, that the size of government inevitably falls or is at the very least constrained if the quality and the efficiency of the services being delivered is improved. So the challenge that we have in front of us uh, is to make sure not only that we contain the size of government, but we also improve the efficiency of the delivery of government services. I think it's also important, as it was in the days of the Thatcher government and under the Reagan administration, it's important to understand the crucial significance of choice uh, in a free and open society. 
expanding choice in the delivery of government services, expanding choice in areas such as education and health services was one of the major objectives of my government. I know that the operation of the British education system and the Australian one is very different in many respects. But we now have in Australia a situation where by some 34% uh, of all Australian school children are now educated in the independent school sector. And the great growth in that sector over the past few years has not been in high fee paying independent schools, but rather in low fee paying independent schools. And for a combination of reasons, increasing numbers of low and middle income Australian parents have voted to send their children to independent schools, side by side of course with the crucial need to maintain the operation of the government school sector to provide uh, that choice to the remaining 66% of the community that believe that the best education for their children is to be obtained in uh, the government school sector. It's also important to find amongst these strands of attitudes and approach over the last uh, 30 or 40 years the commitment of government's free market persuasion to open trade and free flows of foreign investment. My own country has benefited enormously over the last uh, 100 and indeed since European settlement more than 200 years ago has benefited enormously from uh, unfettered foreign investment. It was initially, of course, British investment, then followed by American investment, then by Japanese, and now more recently by Chinese investment. Now, I don't suggest that there aren't other countries that invest in Australia, but they are the major investors, indeed, uh, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom and Japan are still far and away the three largest foreign investors in Australia. And the maintenance of that foreign investment is of tremendous continuing importance to Australia. And Australia has been fortunate in the past uh, 12 months to sign free trade agreements with China, Japan and South Korea, our three major export destinations. Um, I think the world would have preferred uh, to have had another successful multilateral trade round, but the Doha trade negotiations died in the sand, and I don't think they're going to be revived, and therefore a country such as Australia that relies so very heavily on, uh, on exports, particularly of our resources, finds it absolutely essential uh, to have the capacity to, as we do, uh, to negotiate free trade agreements uh, with our major trading partners. I think the maintenance of the values that were espoused by Margaret Thatcher and by Keith Joseph, the maintenance of those values and attitudes, uh, probably at the present time uh, faces the best opportunity that they've had for many decades. The, the reasons I mentioned in in the United States, uh, in Australia, in Great Britain and other countries in the mid-1970s, we had a very uncertain environment. But now in 2015, certainly in the case of your country and mine and New Zealand and Canada, we have four very like-minded governments. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. I think uh, it's one of the phenomena of Australian and British politics that when the Conservative government is in opposition in Britain, it talks to the Liberal Party in government in Australia, and when the reverse is the case, uh, we talk to the Conservatives. And I don't think I'm giving away any bipartisan secrets in saying that when the Labor Party is in opposition in Australia and the Labor government is in government in Britain, it talks, they talk regularly to each other because we do see and we occasionally lend each other campaign directors too. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think it's part of the cross-fertilisation 
uh, that is a welcome feature of the bilateral relationship between our two countries, but it can be taken much further than that. And one of the ways in which it can be taken much further uh, is to look at what each of the governments is doing uh, in some of the areas that I've mentioned. I was saying to your schools minister earlier tonight uh, that many of the things that um, uh, Michael Grove did as Education Secretary in relation to free schools has been copied in one or two Australian states, particularly in Western Australia. Of course, in Australia, uh, schools policy administratively uh, is run at a state level. Now this, of course, is a process that we should embrace, I think, a lot more enthusiastically. Because part of that endless foot race is for all of us to understand that we share a common economic and philosophical future. I'm struck by the resonance that exists between the attitudes of the Conservative Party in Britain and my own party. We have differences on some issues. I think my government's a bit more agnostic on climate change. Uh, I certainly am. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think the same might also be said of the Canadian government. I think it's a little more agnostic on climate change. But these are differences of emphasis uh, they're not fundamental differences of values. And I think I am struck by the remarkable coincidence of views because we share a common uh, experience. Uh, we are all societies that are deeply rooted in the values of the market, of personal freedom, of private property ownership, uh, of a belief that the taxpayers' money is there to be used on trust and if it's badly used or if there's any of it left over then it ought to be returned to the citizen uh, and not invested in wasteful public expenditure. They were very much the values of Keith Joseph and of Margaret Thatcher and tonight as we uh, recall Keith Joseph's extraordinary contribution to public policy in Great Britain and the great influence that he had on Margaret Thatcher. We should again remind ourselves, as I did at the beginning of my remarks, that the context in which the Centre of Policy Studies was established uh, was a very daunting and challenging one. We look back now with some pride on what's been achieved. Uh, we congratulate those who've gone before us and uh, ourselves as well on having been successful in winning much of the intellectual fight over a period of decades. But it was a very challenging and hostile environment in the mid-1970s. And that is a reminder of how successful those remarkable people have done, have been, but also a challenge to ensure that we never give up in that endless foot race. Because if we do, uh, others will surge past us and our societies and our communities and our families will be the poorer as a consequence. I thank you. I mean, whether Britain, what Britain does with Europe is Britain's business. Uh, let me make that very clear. Um, I have a view that um, the <clears throat> centre of gravity of the world's economy has shifted 
uh, to the Asia Pacific region. I also have a view that of all the European countries, uh, none by dint of history, culture, language and so forth, uh, more readily assimilates with the Asian Pacific region than Britain. Um, English is the lingua franca of Asia. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. But, um, as far as trade complementarity is concerned, well, um, our three best customers, speaking uh, from Australia's point of view, are China, Japan and Korea. And all I can say as an Australian is, thank heavens, we negotiated uh, a commerce agreement with Japan way back in 1957, uh, despite the lingering bitterness of World War II and the treatment of Australian prisoners of war by the Japanese, because 1957 was the year of the Treaty of Rome, the foundation document of the common market and now of the European Union. And of course, uh, as one of the consequences of that was the dismantling of imperial preference, which had been established at Ottawa in 1932. So I think the question of whether Britain leaves Europe or what relationship uh, Britain has with Europe has to be conditioned by Britain's interests. Uh, and I would have thought from a trade perspective, um, her opportunities in the Asian region are likely to grow uh, rather than contract. That's an assessment. But from Australia's point of view, we will look to our interests, where they coincide with, with British interests, so they'll be pulled together. But can I make the observation in this context that uh, it's very interesting that uh, the heart does not always follow the trade. Um, the Malawi Institute in Australia, a think tank, established by the man who uh, I think has brought about a bit of a revolution in, uh, in, in shopping in, in Britain, Frank Lowy, who established Westfield. Um, the, the, in, the Institute every year carries out a survey on public attitudes. And one of the very interesting things they have is they call it a warmth barometer. And uh, they list a number of countries and they ask the people in the survey what their attitude is, how, do, how warm or whatever uh, they feel towards individual countries. And you'd be interested to know that despite the fact that Britain has gone from once 50 years ago being, more than 50 years ago being our best customer to being something like 10 or 11, despite the fact uh, I can tell you that New Zealand and Britain still finish up, uh, end up on top of that warm survey. Now, I think I can say that, you know, None of the respondents to the survey attend Ashes Test matches at the Sydney Cricket Ground or Lords, <laughs> where there's a decided lack of warmth uh, uh, between the two countries. But I think it's uh, an indication that people do have a capacity to separate trade from sentiment. But look, Britain has to make a decision of her own about that. Uh, and uh, she will look to her interests and Australia will to her own and, and, and where they coincide all about. On the left hand row there. Let's start here, yes, I think they're so Trixie Gardner from Parks in Australia. Um, I would like to ask you a little about your own personal position about how you became Prime Minister. Because when I first went to Australia when I went to Australia and I first heard you speak, I thought you were marvellous. And I went away and spoke to my family and I said and I just heard this man, I thought he was terrific. They said, no, no, he's had his chance, he's finished. He's <laughs> and this was before you had all these wins as Prime Minister. Could you tell us how you achieved that? Because it really was quite extraordinary. They were so clear that you hadn't a hope in the world. <laughs> so all of your friends voted late, did they? <laughs> uh, look, look I, I'm asked that question. I, I guess it's uh, uh, persistence. When you actually look at the political careers of people, uh, it's rare that anybody gets to the top without a lot of adversity. I've just finished writing a book on uh, the longest serving Australian Prime Minister, Robert Gordon Menzies, who was Prime Minister between 1949 and 1966. But he'd been Prime Minister once before. He was Prime Minister in 1939. He took Australia to war alongside Britain, immediately war was declared. 
uh, in uh, September of 1939. And he was pushed out of office by his colleagues after only two and a half years. And everybody thought he was completely finished. But he uh, regrouped the anti-Labor parties, launched the Liberal Party and came back and, you know, in, my, in my view, so dominated Australian politics like no other person has done at any time. So I think persistence. The other thing is to have a very strong set of beliefs. People said all sorts of things about me when I was Prime Minister and I accepted that. The one that really warmed my heart more than any, this is the makes the criticism, uh, was uh, I heard somebody say once, I can't abide John Howard, I despise everything that he stands for. But at least I know what he stands for. And uh, I think that is a very important lesson in politics. People liked Margaret Thatcher, but people respected Margaret Thatcher. A lot of them didn't like her. A lot of people didn't like me. But the thing is that they knew what she stood for. And uh, that was her great quality, and I think it's an abiding quality for anybody who wants to be successful in politics. On the left here, yes. Uh, Bernard Herman, member of the Centre for Policy Studies. One of success over the last 30 years of the Anglo-Saxon conservatism is that there are many millions of people in other parts of the world who want to come and live in our countries, more than we can reasonably accommodate. If Prime Minister Cameron asks you to advise him on how to deal with question <laughs> in Cali and Dover at the moment, what advice would you be given? Well, he can't really do anything about that unless he gets regains control of his borders. Simple as that. Yeah. That is the only advice I can give. I mean, you cannot. Well, I mean, this is this is a con. This is. But, but you've, you've really, I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm straying into domestic politics and I'm not meant to do that. Well, that may be former Prime Ministers can, but uh, uh, I mean, that is the reality. Unless you have control of your borders, uh, and, and uh, it's one of the consequences of being part of a, a, a multinational body, that uh, you've given up control of your borders. Now, I wouldn't like to be in that situation. Uh, I think there's, a, there's an extraordinary humanitarian challenge, but there is a limit to how many people any country can take. And, and I feel for the Italians. I think they have a terrible problem. Uh, they really do, because they're, they're geographically right there. Uh, and, and we've got this awful challenge in, in our part of the world from the persecution of the Rohingya in Burma. And they are being persecuted. You know, I mean, they, you're not even allowed to use the word uh, to describe this ethnic group. And they are being persecuted <clears throat> in a most shameful way. But um, I mean, in the end, uh, this is one of the issues that, that Britain faces in relation to the negotiations with Europe, because it seems that two things that two of the consequences of membership of the union is a you, you, you don't have freedom of movement in negotiating trade agreements. Uh, and, 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 of course, migration. You know. yeah. These are matters that the British government and the British people will have to grapple with. On the left. John Wilden. Um, Mr Howard, could you give us your thoughts about how you see currencies in the next 20 or 30 years? Is sorry, Bitcoin sorry, going... Sorry. sorry. Could, could, start that again? I'm a little could, could, could you tell us your thoughts about the future of currencies Current. in the next 20 or 30 years? Do you think Bitcoin is very important? This is a week when the euro has possibly been challenged for the first time. <laughs> well, if I could really answer that question, I'd make a fortune in my post-political <laughs> career. <laughs> I really would. When I was... Treasurer and then Prime Minister in, in governments in Australia, I was asked what was going to happen to the dollar. What would I think about the value of the dollar? And I said, where it is now is about right. <laughs> which, was, which was all I had any hope of doing. Look, I, I think I mean, inevitably we're, uh, we're moving uh, uh, to, um, uh, when it comes to cash, a, a more paperless society. We're obviously 
As far as individual currencies are concerned, um, I'm, I don't think there'd be many people in Britain at the present time who regret the fact that Britain didn't join the Eurozone. Um, I don't think there'd be too many supporters of membership of the Eurozone at the present time in this country. I think um, that um, the, I'll make a prediction that in 50 years time, the American dollar will still be the principal reserve currency. And uh, I'll make a, a like prediction that in 50 years time, uh, the United States will still be the dominant power in the world. I don't share the view that China is going to overwhelm the United States. I think um, what's happened in China in humanitarian terms in the last 20 years has been wonderful. You've seen hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. And the growth of China has been good, not only for China, but also for the world. And uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. And for people who believe that the solution to world poverty is uh, uh, direct government assistance, uh, I'd point to China. The, the best antidote to world poverty is economic growth. And China has been a, a magnificent example of that. I think China's got two big problems. I think China's uh, uh, got a demographic problem. Uh, if you think ageing is a challenge in many European countries, uh, it's an even greater challenge in China. And of course, uh, the other great challenge that China's got is uh, what's going to happen as people who take affluence for granted start to chafe have been told how to live their lives. I think that is the other great challenge China has. Now that's wandering off currencies, but uh, uh, I, I think that um, the, I think the Euro will remain, but I, I think the membership of the Euro must come under question, despite what's been agreed. And I've read about these agreements and information <coughs> own mind up about them and uh, uh, thank you lucky stars that you're not part of it, although I notice in the papers that uh, uh, the Europeans are trying to include Britain in paying the cost of the bailout. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. Middle, middle road. Thank you very much. Tom Packers. I'm, a, I'm at St Anne's College, Oxford, but I'm certainly not representing them here. Um, my, my question, um, you have so many overwhelming successes in government. Um, I want to ask about one success and one slightly less successful one. The one I was wondering, it's well known that you managed to introduce a form of modified voucher scheme that led to the one in three people attending pri um, private schools in Australia. I would be really interested in insights into how you think that can work. And secondly, your labour reforms, work choices, that you yourself said were partly repealed and there was enormous political backlash against them. Of course, we're considering union reform again in Britain at the moment. So again, I was wondering if you had some insights into the difficulties of that. We didn't actually um, introduce a voucher scheme. We expressly um, decided against a voucher scheme for the very simple reason that <clears throat> the principal um, recipient of <clears throat> government help in the non-government uh, sector is the systemic school system run by the Catholic Church in Australia. And it always wanted, for very understandable reasons, uh, wanted block grants being made to the school systems of the various dioceses and archdioceses. And what the church would do with the money was to distribute it according to its own assessment of need within the diocese. We looked at vouchers but uh, decided for you know, common sense reasons not to embrace them. Now, um, you're asking me what the second question is about work choice. Oh, oh work choice. Well, um, there, were, there were three major pieces of industrial relations reform under my government, just as there were several under the Thatcher government. The first was the Workplace Relations Act in 1996, which established individual workplace contracts without the compulsory injection of a union. Now that was the first. The second was, of course, the titanic struggle we had with the Maritime Union of Australia to uh, bring back law and order on the waterfront. And uh, 
we, we had an appallingly inefficient waterfront. And uh, as a result of these reforms that were very controversial, there was a lot of violence on the picket line, but eventually we got acceptance, and as a result, productivity on the wharves shot up. And that was the second reform. The third reform was other than work choices legislation. And one aspect of that, um, I think, was uh, uh, misjudged the mood of the electorate and would have played a part in our defeat. I think the main reason we lost in 2007 was the public had got bored with us. And uh, that happened with any government. We, in fact, had some research carried out six months before the election that said one of the problems we faced about re-election was that people thought the economy was going so well that anybody could run it. And, uh, and that uh, people thought uh, China's voracious appetite for our resources uh, played a major role in economic growth. But uh, the work choices legislation, uh, in other respects, I thought was quite good, but there's a common misbelief that work choices covered all of the industrial race reforms we carried out. Now, all of the ones that I mentioned, apart from the changes on the waterfront that have remained, or that have been chipped away a bit uh, by the subsequent Labor government, they've been wound back. And uh, you now, you don't have individual contracts, you don't have any sensible unfair dismissal laws for small business. Uh, they've all been wound back, and I think that's one of the uh, very regressive parts of, of labour market reform. It's a situation where we have stopped running and some of our competitors have gone past us. I have to let um, John Howard go in a few minutes, but I'm going to, um, let me take one more question, and I'm going to exercise uh, my right to ask the last question. I think in the middle. Yes, right there. Hugo de Berg from the China Media Centre. When you mentioned education in Australia, I was reminded that Keith Joseph was perhaps the first senior British politician to identify and try and prescribe for the problems of state education here. How is it that you have now in Australia a situation that such a high proportion of people are going to independent schools? Is there something wrong with state education? Or is it that the independent schools are just so much better? Tell me. Well, and, you know, can I say, I speak of, uh, as somebody who is myself totally educated in the state education system at what would roughly pass as the Australian equivalent of a grammar school in using UK language. Um, I think it's a combination of reasons. I think it's the, one of the reasons is that after the introduction of what was called <clears throat> a free compulsory secular education in the 19th century. The Catholic community maintained an extraordinary economic sacrifice, its own school system. And um, as late as in the early 1960s, 20% of Australian children were educated in the Catholic system. So you always had, and then when state aid was introduced, that's uh, government assistance for independent schools that introduced, it had as its sort of base uh, that large number, that 20% of uh, uh, Catholic schools. You had a small number of what, to use the language, uh, high fee paying, elite privilege, whatever you want to call them, uh, private schools. And you've seen a massive expansion though in the low fee paying, largely Christian, but not all Christian. We provide state government help to um, state assistance, rather, to uh, obviously Islamic or Jewish schools, and there's a complete equivalence of, of treatment. I think it's a, you always started off with a high percentage for that historical reason I've explained. And then on top of that, I think the, there's a growing number of people who see the values taught in independent schools as being attractive even though people, parents who send their children to church schools may not themselves necessarily be religious, but they are attracted to the values. Um, I think there is a concern on the part of some people that uh, there is a strand of thought within the teaching profession that does not always uphold traditional attitudes and values, and they would like um, their children to receive some of those traditional attitudes and values. 
So it's a combination, and I don't think it's fair to say that the state system is seen as failing. I think it's a bit like the curate said, it's very good in parts. Um, and when you look at the tables of schools, the, the, the selective high schools, which are the, what are the, you know, the equivalent of the British grammar schools, they perform very well uh, alongside the, uh, the high fee paying uh, schools. Uh, so I think it's a combination of those reasons, but it's certainly a very high percentage. But there's some of the historical reasons for it. There are many of you, like um, like me, who have written down many questions which we would like to ask John now. Um, but I'm, I'm going to, if I may, ask him the last question. I, I'd like you, please, to help the audience with um, a subject which has become um, what should we call it? The, the, the third rail of British politics. In other words, touch it and die. And the the subject is Islam and immigration. So I'd like I, perhaps you can help us with this puzzle, particularly me. I was recently admonished by religious leaders for my use of the word with approval. The use of the word assimilation. I was told that this is not an appropriate word to use. This is by all religious leaders. Not an appropriate word to use. Why not? Because um, the word assimilation is no longer considered appropriate in terms of the relationship between religions in that it implies um, uh, a league table of religions, uh, a supremacy by one religion over another, and therefore the word is no longer considered appropriate. In answer to the question, well, what word is considered appropriate? The answer was that the new word which is considered appropriate is, assimilate, is not assimilation, it is integration. So I'd like to ask you um, what you make of that, and what would be your advice to all of us who are so puzzled about the correct approach to this question. Who did you say admonished you? Uh, I would say the, um, the collective might of all the religious leaders of Britain. I th it's interesting. <clears throat> I have used the word, and the word assimilation was used very widely in this program in relation to immigration. Now, the modern word is multiculturalism. Now, <clears throat> I have never been comfortable with the word multiculturalism. I don't really think you can be multicultural. Um, I haven't met a multicultural person. I've met quite a number of bicultural people. I, mean, I, I had a magnificent chief of staff who was of Greek heritage, and he was as Australian as the gum tree, but he was very proud of his Greek background. Now, I never thought Arthur was multicultural. I thought he was bicultural. And, and, you know, can, uh, I, I, I've, I've had a lot of trouble with that too, and I, I've said, I said that when I was Prime Minister. Uh, I thought the great success of Australia, immigration in the 50s, 60s and 70s, was we brought people initially, didn't bring Asians, and, but that was changed when the white Australia policy was dismantled in the late 1960s. We brought people from everywhere, and the idea was that you became Australian. They, were, they called them new Australians at the time. I didn't think there was anything particularly wrong with that, because they were new to Australia. Why well, wouldn't you call them a new Australian to start with? I mean, it just seemed quite odd. But now that's, you know, you're not going to say that now. Uh, and, uh, but that's, that's OK. Um, I don't think they could work up about that. But I've never heard the word assimilation used in relation to religion. I've always seen it used in relation to people coming from different parts of the world. But look, every country has a core culture. And it's defined as much as anything else by the language you speak. Because the language you speak brings a tradition of literature, of history, uh, of values, and all that sort of thing. And the idea that you can have a, a sort of multicultural core culture, I, I just admit, I, I, I find that, and the, the best evidence I have of you know, my continuing belief that this is the right approach. 
that shall I outline I suspect you're in sympathy with, is, is I talk to friends of mine who either immigrated from Europe in the 1950s and uh, uh, or their parents did and they're very much part of the Australian community, they still have an affection for the country from which their parents came and that's perfectly human and natural. But they were all very much of the view that uh, you come to Australia, you become part of Australian society. And I think we, <clears throat> we overdo this desire to re remove any possible remote the remote possibility that we might offend somebody by trying to find these bland words. Now, integration, incidentally, by some of the cultural dietitians in Australia, um, <clears throat> integration is regarded as not as bad as assimilation, but much worse than multiculturalism. <laughs> so, you know, as far as the cultural dietitians are concerned, you've got, you know, multiculturalism is um, uh, integration, oh no, uh, assimilation never let it breathe its name. Now that basically is uh, what uh, the mood is in Australia. I haven't heard it, but I mean, some, one of the problems with all this, the verbal gymnastics, is we end up no longer communicating with people what we actually mean. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I think that imposes a burden on our society that we could do without. So, I'm sorry you were admonished. Um, uh, you didn't deserve that. Uh, and, uh, but I haven't believed that you'd uh, been admonished be by, uh, because you applied assimilation to religion. Um, yeah, it's a bit hard to... Con uh, well, I once, as part of um, the centenary of the Federation in Australia, attended a function organised by a state government and it was to celebrate the contribution of religion to Australia. And unfortunately, they settled on this idea that they had a service that paid due regard uh, to uh, not only each of the Christian denominations, but also to you know, uh, Judaism, Islam, Hindu religion, Buddhism, and so forth. And of course, it would have been so much better for uh, the Catholics to have had a service and the Presbyterians and then to have one at the synagogue and to have one at a mosque and, and I'd been very happy to go on with many of those as I could but to having an hour long service that had sort of three and a half minutes for the Uniting Church and ten minutes for the something it was terrible uh, uh, and, and it lacked, I mean it would have provided no spiritual nourishment of any description uh, to anybody I mean I, I can just imagine uh, a person of Islamic or Jewish background sort of saying, what on earth am I doing here uh, in relation to this? So I think you can carry this business to extremes. And uh, I mean, we should understand that people come to Britain because they basically think this is a better country to live in than the country they've come from. Why do they think that? Because of what Britain stands for and what Britain believes in and the freedom this country has given to people. And why we should apologise for requiring people uh, to uh, live according to the laws and the mores, practising their own faith in their own way in a respectful fashion to others, but not so bending over backwards to avoid any possibility of offence uh, that we suck uh, national identity from a certain amount of meaning. I just can't understand that. Don't come and sit down.